I want to take this occasion to tell you how critical the role was of Gallagher Memorial Library in making this book happen. Uh, I, I pestered the interlibrary loan librarians for the last probably 25 years. There is nothing that they can't get. And I am so grateful to them for their assistance. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to Yuda Silbert, who has really been a guide throughout this long research journey, and also helped me when I fell into a panic trying to put together the bibliography last year. And uh, finally, I also want to recognize the very portal of uh, UCM and uh, Creative Services. It is thanks to her that the book has a family tree and 38 other fantastic illustrations. So thank you very much. There are many other people here that I'd like to thank for their moral support, for their advice uh, as fellow historians. But I'll get uh, right to the subject of my talk, which is really how this book came to be. Now, I'm happy, obviously, to talk about her as well. Uh, Sophia Pine is one of my favorite topics. And, but I, uh, I took the lead from the library director that it might be interesting to tell you first about how I became interested in this topic that then I spent the next uh, 25 years working on and my research and writing journey. And I'm going to uh, read to you at certain times fairly short excerpts, at least I hope fairly short excerpts uh, from the introduction. So first of all, people often ask, well, how did you become interested in Baptist Sophia Rodzina Lugna Hanina? The accent is on the first syllable, Hanina. And I, I explain that in the course of doing research for my first book on the history of charity, I became interested in the role that women played in Russian charity. And I looked and I looked, I looked for the equivalent of JMs. <coughs> and lo and behold, I found that there was a woman, Sophia Panina, who uh, was called in a couple of uh, uh, historical works, the Russian JMs, and that her papers were deposited in the Bakhmantiv archive at Columbia University. So, <laughs> That's easy. She died in New York City in 1956. She left her papers to Columbia. I want you to go to Russia. It's kind of an easy research project and it's biography. That's so much easier than the monograph that I've just finished. The biography, after all, has a beginning and a middle and an end. And so here we are more than 25 years later. <laughs> I learned a lot about uh, various things. I discovered, this is uh, in the early 90s, I, I went to the archive and discovered the 16 boxes of fascinating materials, letters and notes and photographs, and a couple of memoirs, uh, short autobiographical uh, segments that she had, fragments that she had written. And I had a trip to Russia planned for November of 1991. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll see if anybody knows anything about her over in Russia. Because not many people in my field of Russian history had even heard about her, and there was no biography uh, of her uh, in Russian, in English, or in <coughs> So in November of 1991, I traveled to Russia to look for traces of the life of a woman named Sofia Panin. Born in 1871, descended from the Russian aristocracy's highest ranks, and heiress to one of its great fortunes. Countess Panina won the admiration of progressive contemporaries for her work to expand access to education and culture for the working class. 
early in the revolutionary year of 1917, after the monarchy fell and a provisional government took over Russia's deteriorating military front and collapsing economy, Pioneer moved onto the political stage and attracted national and international attention as the first woman in world history to occupy a ministerial position in a government. After a second revolution in October, top of that government, the liberal countess became an envy of the people. And in December 1917, citizen Pioneer was charged with stealing government funds and faced the Bolsheviks' new revolutionary tribunal in their first trial of a political opponent. Few works by Russian historians have mentioned her name, and her remarkable life had never been written. I only learned about her and, of course, research for her book on Russian charity. Were Russians equally unaware, I wonder, of a woman who was counted among the best known members of her generation? Although I had visited Russia and lived there numerous times before, never before had the country seemed as dark as it did that November of 1991. Light fixtures were missing, with missing the low light bulbs barely illuminated the airport and railroad station and other public places. Anger and anxiety darkened the public mood as well. Chaos and rebellion are imminent, a fearful Moscow was warning. There is nothing to eat and nothing to buy, a cab driver complained bitterly, not even underwear. A Petersburg friend was concerned about my welfare. There's rationing in the city, she said, and the shops are empty, and I don't know how you leave. In Red Square on November 7th, the recently abolished holiday commemorating the Bolshevik Revolution, I watched irate citizens arguing with each other over whether the communists, the West, or the Jews had stolen Russia's wealth. A few weeks after my departure on Christmas Day, 1991, President Mikhail Gorbachev announced the dissolution of the USSR to shock the populace. As the hammer and sickle was lowered over the Kremlin, the new flag of the Russian Federation, adopted from the Romanovs imperial tricolor, rose above the capital and the country. Thus began one of the most troubled decades in Russian history characterized by political disarray, capture, loss of international power and prestige, failed economic reforms, and the outspread suffering. Yet amidst the pessimism that darkened those November days, there were unmistakable signs of resilience, energy, and initiative. In June 1991, Leningrad residents, for example, had voted to renounce the city's revolutionary past and restore the name in their proud and possessed before World War I as the capital of one of history's great empires, St. Petersburg. The vote symbolically expressed the efforts by countless Russians to bring to light forgotten chapters in their recent past and forgotten individuals, heroes as well as villains. For a group of St. Petersburg activists I met that November, one of those heroes was Countess Sofia Vladimirovna Kanina. Toward the end of my stay in the city, I took a tram to a gritty industrial neighborhood, searching doubtfully for surviving remnants of the People's House, the educational and cultural institution Sophia Pinan had built for workers in 1903. I was astonished, and I mean truly astonished, when I turned the corner, and there it was, an imposing complex of well-designed brick buildings, wholly intact, and immediately recognizable from the photographs that I'd seen in the back end of the book. Remarkably, Sophia Pinus People's House, known since the 1920s as the Railroad Workers' Palace of Culture, still graced its nondescript surroundings, having survived the October 1917 Socialist Revolution, the siege and bombings of World War II, and Soviet Bureau attempts to erase the material Inside the buildings, the institution's pre-revolutionary importance was on full display. In the center of the spacious main hall hung a war portrait of its aristocratic founder, a copy of one of in 1909 by Yudhya the eminent realist artist, and Sophia Pondra's personal friend. 
on the walls and exhibit celebrated with pre revolutionary origins and history of the Venus Mars. While accentuating continuities with Soviet Europe cultural institutions. The inspiration behind the reclamation of this institution's pre revolutionary past, as you learned, came from its director, staff, and volunteers. A small but ardent group composed of students on internships and professionals experienced in the Red Bull Clubs, local historians and retired teachers, amateur poets and artists, all unified by a mission to preserve, reinvigorate, and reinvent this outmoded institution, the Palace of Culture. One way to move their country forward, they believed, was to look back to the ideals embraced by the institution's founder, and to study its pre revolutionary record of cultural uplift and educational advancement among some of St. Petersburg's poorest and most culturally deprived inhabitants. The day that I spent there, and the day is subsequently during the rest of the 1990s, I will never forget. It was dark, it was depressing. The country was sliding towards civil war, and yet here was this group of people who were inspired and passionate about the opportunities of reclaiming the past. Heroes like Candace Pagna as a guide for the future. So I came back from that trip. Um, actually, uh, remember talking about my colleague and friend Mark Galicchio at the time saying, boy, do I have a new project, and everything I need is in New York City. Uh, so it should be, it should be done, it should be done pretty soon. Uh, but I, I had a lot to learn, and I had a lot to figure out. I had to figure out, first of all, what the goals of this book should be. And I didn't want it to be, oh, here's just, here's, here's a book everybody needs to read about somebody who's been unjustly forgotten by history. Kind of a, let's add women and a stir approach to history. <laughs> I was intrigued by the challenge of reconstructing what I soon learned was a very interrupted life. Born in 1871 in Moscow, Sofia lived for most of the pre-revolutionary period in the city of St. Petersburg, where she had a mansion in the central uh, part, the elite part of the city, but spent uh, most of her days at the people's house. And, oh, she also had this nice place on the Crimea, <laughs> and uh, there's some photos of uh, another one of her estates outside Moscow. But St. Petersburg was, was her beloved home, the city she deeply identified with. Uh, she remained in, in the, the renamed city of Petrograd through World War One and Russian Revolution. Uh, fleeing south from Petrograd at the, at the beginning of 1918, after she was released from prison. She spent uh, the next two years in southern Russia with a brief trip to Paris and London to try to persuade the Allies to support the White Side, then traveled all the way back to southern Russia in the midst of the Civil War, before finally fleeing in 1920 as Bolsheviks shelled the port uh, and spent the rest of her life first in Geneva, then in Prague, and then finally in New York and California. What an interrupted life. She lived for 85 years, but she continually had to reinvent herself. Even before world historical events fragmented that life. As a child, as a young woman, she reinvented herself a very proper heiress and child of the aristocracy into someone who some of her family members considered a socialist and who was sometimes called the Red Countess. So my first goal then was to try to reconstruct this life, which was harder than I thought because she never wrote a full-length autobiography. 
thinking. And still, if, uh, if you read this book, there are certainly uh, what, they, what they call in Russian white spots, blank spots, that uh, I am not able to fill in. I also wanted, uh, I will admit, I wanted to restore this woman to her rightful place in Russian and world history of the 20th century. And <coughs> with your permission, I will read another paragraph from the introduction. Embarking on this book, I sought to discover what enabled Sophia Panina not only to survive the cataclysms of her era, three revolutions, two world wars, uh, mass refugee crisis, uh, emigration from Russia to Europe, from Europe to the United States. Not only to survive these cataclysms, but also to recreate a purposeful life. In wartime and revolution at Petrograd, in southern Russia with the anti bolshevik main army, and in exile in Geneva, Prague, and New York. Russia's revolutionary history has seldom been told from a perspective such as hers. In most accounts, women appear in the historical narrative primarily as working class and peasant housewives and soldiers' wives, who as instigators of red riots sparked political protests but never led them, and who neither constituted an organized force nor exerted a decisive influence on the revolution. Recently, historians have become the important work of uncovering and analyzing Russian women's immense contributions to their country during World War I and their struggle to attain political rights and civil equality in 1917. Russian women received full political equality and voting rights three years before women in the United States and uh, in the law passed in July of 1917, the law that Sophia Kahneman was very instrumental in about. The voices of individual women are still all but absent in most accounts of Russia's revolution. When it comes to biography, it is the ill-fated Empress Alexander, a revolutionary such as the Bolshevik Alexander Polotai, who received most of the attention. The American journalist Louise Bryant, whose name we watched Reds years ago, we remember Diane Keaton. Uh, in one of her best roles, I think, as Louise Bryant, who attended Sophia's trial in Petrograd in December 1917, established the precedent in her book that history is written about the victims and not the losers. Uh, Louise Bryant's book, Six Red Rooms in Russia, draws a somewhat forced parallel between Sophia, whom she misidentifies as the former Minister of Welfare, and Colin Tai, who stepped into power in October 1917 as Commissar of Social Security. <coughs> While Colin Tai Bryant claims was much loved by the masses, Hanina, quote, has been swept aside in the public regard after the harsh test of revolution. So I wasn't going to take that lying down. <laughs> uh, I did want to uh, try my best to write history, first of all, from the side of the losers, as a leader of the uh, most important and the largest non-socialist political party, the cadets in revolutionary Russia. Sophia definitely ended up on the losing side of the Russian Revolution, on the losing side of history. Spent almost the, about the last third of her life as a stateless <laughs> refugee. Um, so it was interesting to write history from the perspective of the loser. I also wanted to try to understand what enabled her to survive the personal adversity she went through as a child and as a young woman. And then the historical upheavals that afflicted her from 1914 through her uh, flight from Czechoslovakia at the end of 1914 in New York City. How did she manage to survive? How did she manage 
just going to be a vent for self. Every person can take the back of across 85 years of this long, interrupted life. So those were the goals of this book. So uh, quickly I realized that uh, it was, research wasn't going to be easy because this wonderful archive in New York was actually only those papers that she managed to save uh, from uh, her earlier life in Russia. And there were very few. And most of uh, the materials were from her life after leaving Russia. So trying to identify where the sources would be of this interrupted and fragmented life proved to be both a great challenge and a great joy. During the early stages of this project, I was sometimes despaired of finding sufficient source material for the kind of in-depth analysis of Sophia finding as an individual that I wished to undertake. Given what seemed to be a dearth of personal records and her own resistance, she was an intensely private person, I feared that my research would just produce another example of the bad women in stir approach to women's history. A two-dimensional reconstruction of the life of a worthy woman unjustly ignored by the stories. And I continued my search, as I continued my search, exciting discoveries began to fill in the gaps. And this was by far the most wonderful research adventure I could possibly imagine. I did not think it was going to take me more than 20 years. But it took me to 10 different libraries and archives in Russia, five different uh, repositories, libraries and archives in the US, uh, four in the US, three in Great Britain, one in France, uh, plus just mining all the resources of libraries in this country and abroad, thanks to Dr. Memorial Library's interlibrary loan. Uh, this, this was made more challenging because of uh, the, especially in Russia, the vagaries of archives and libraries after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I was unable to get into one archive in St. Petersburg, which was critical for establishing the history of her people's house because it was condemned by the fire marshal and closed for about a decade. And I only managed to get in in 2005 when it was first opened. In the late 90s, I worked in an archive in which uh, there was a table with four seats. And you had to get there first thing in the morning, or you didn't have a seat. And you listened all day to the two, uh, in Russian it's Jotki, the two, the two aunties, the two old ladies, the, the harpies who guarded this archive, <laughs> complaining about the users of the archive and their low pay, and uh, that was memorable. <laughs> there were other obstacles as well. Uh, the, uh, one of the challenges, especially in the 90s, working in Russian archives and libraries was to find the one acceptable toilet and uh, just make sure that you, you brought your own paper. Uh, it became really quite an adventure. Conditions became better and better over the years, but I was still finding uh, with treasures and adversity in uh, 2011 and 12 when I did my final trips to Russian archives. Um, I had some extraordinarily fortuitous, uh, real strokes of luck. In the late 90s, about 9.30 at night, my telephone rang, and a man's voice said, well, Professor Lindenmeyer? I said, yes. Uh, my name is Vlad Lukovic, and I understand you're writing a biography of my aunt. So, Sofia Panina uh, had no children and she had no siblings. So she had no direct descendants. But uh, 
in Russian families, there are all kinds of collateral relationships. And uh, Vlad Lukovic, who lives in Washington, D.C., he's a retired foreign service officer, is the grandson of her first cousin. And he knew her as a child in New York City. He knew her as Aunt Sophie, who occasionally babysat for him and his sister. Lisa. And he has a valise that was left after her death in 1956 in New York with his father, who was her executor, in their Manhattan apartment and pipe burst and soaked the closet with the suitcase in it. Nobody ever opened the suitcase until he and I opened it decades later and carefully, carefully pried apart the moldy pieces of paper that had been stuck together and found just treasure after treasure, things that she just, uh, all the biographical sketches that she had left unfinished and thrown into this movies and photographs and watercolors and a lot of it was so long together you couldn't really tell what it was. That started then uh, a, a long relationship with the Hlohovich family. Uh, Vlad is the source of many of the photographs and documents that I was able to use in this in this book as well. So that was extraordinary, and that was due to the fact that I had invited a speaker from Washington, D.C. to give a talk here at the one of it in the mid-90s, and she turned out to be his next door neighbor. <laughs> so it's, it's just an extraordinary role of coincidence. I'll give you a, a, another example of how I just kind of stumbled along in doing the research on this. So, the major archive in Moscow is called uh, GARF, the State Archive of the Russian Federation. It contains uh, 20th century documents of Russian history, especially revolutionary history. And I was there to research the uh, files on her trial of the Bolsheviks in late 1917. And working in Russian archives is extremely I won't bore you with the details, but it is just agony. And toward the end of my stay, this young woman sitting in the booth where you had to submit your slip and wait, you had to wait three days to get your next three files. She finally took pity on me and she said, have you been to room 53? I said, room 53. What's room 53? Well, downstairs, go look in room 53. So I found room 53. That's all it says. My assessment, 53. <laughs> and it's across from the roof yet. And so I knocked timidly on the door, and another two of them opened the door, and it turned into the wall after wall of file drawers from the Russian secret police the pre-revolutionary secret police, all organized alphabetically by last name. They looked up Khanina, Petrin Kerch, you could look at anybody up and you immediately got the file folders for their secret police files. So I took those numbers upstairs to the little girl in the window and I had the files that the police had kept on her and her and her stepmother. Was all thanks to room 50. <laughs> and somebody taking a picture of me. And then, in, a, in another, and this is the last one I'll mention, in another lucky stroke that my fellow historians will recognize, I was reading an article, this was in 2011, that somebody had sent me that mentioned her. And the article quoted her. And I had never read this book before. <coughs> never seen it before. Immediately went to the footnote. And the reference was to a letter she had written to a friend, a childhood friend, whom I'd never heard of before. And the archival citation of where these letters were kept. It turns out there was in a in a collection whose name I never would have identified. There was a, a series of 
about 53, 53 again, 53 letters that she wrote as a child and a young woman to her best friends. The only letters that, uh, well, that's yeah, not exactly true. Um, in Russian, there's a familiar view and a formal view, and these were some of the few documents. You know, written was her friend from her childhood that she, that she wrote uh, using her personal view. And as a result of finding those letters, I had to rewrite a chapter and a half. So those are some of the reasons why this book took such a very long time. Finally, I had to learn how to do biography. Now, usually I thought, well, it's easy, somebody's born, they live, they die. Book is over, it's a straight line. Um, but this turned out to be uh, the result of total ignorance. I actually don't even like reading biographies all that much. I like them more than I used to, but I never had imagined writing work uh, myself, and I was quite ignorant of the genre, and in her case, I had to start from scratch, because there was no biography, uh, and there were lots of incorrect uh, or biased accounts of her. She was a political enemy in the very large Soviet canon of political enemies for most of the 20th century. So I had to teach myself how to do biography, and I would say, that absolutely essential goal in, in my own education was uh, the year-long graduate biography course that I took twice, first in 06-07 uh, and then 2011 and 2012. Uh, together, my graduate class and I learned about different types of biography, the obstacles and the doors of doing biography. And so people saying all the time, oh, we learn so much from my students, but in this case I really did. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really uh, fantastic, fantastic experience. I will just conclude then before uh, taking any questions that you might have. Uh, I'll just conclude by, by saying that I, I found Sophia herself to be very <laughs> difficult to be biographical. Subject. Not just because of this interrupted life, not just because as, as a, a product of her era and her class, she was a very healthy person, but because of her personality. So, I'll just finish with this uh, excerpt from the introduction. A still greater challenge in writing a biography of Sophie Heinemann has to do with her many admirable qualities. As a girl and a young woman, she faced heartbreak, adversity, and empathy and resilience. In prison and on trial, she defended her principles and values. Once one of Russia's wealthiest women, she spent the last 36 years of her life as an emigrant, living frugally but with no complaint of her own her earnings. Feeling a bit guilty and unfair, Sophia's biographer must try to look past her charm and accomplishments in order to achieve a balance of interpretation. This is del the dilemma encountered by the quote, historians who love too much, and as described by historian and author Joe Ford. Here, several years ago. Finding out and writing about people living or dead is truly work, she wrote. You must balance intimacy with distance while at the same time being inquisitive to the point of I found there's a danger of getting too close to that subject and moving too far with it. At the same time, there's the risk of not getting to know one subject well enough by being too respectful and insufficiently nosy. It has often been difficult to overcome the influence of this generous man more than an energetic man, with a passion and a heat of Moreover, it is virtually impossible to find a single negative opinion in the surviving stories. Family and friends of war. And according to the rec recollections of Vlad Lukovic, she was, and Sophie was a warm and cozy figure to come along famously with her much younger niece, my mother, and had a close and affectionate rapport with her. 
with her smiling face and person of questions, she had an utterly unknown set of ways of talking and an engaging way Even Louise Bryant, her portion of judgments about Sophia Cunningham's principles and actions, responded to the charm of the one she describes as gay and amusing, who loved to tell funny animals. My hope is that readers will understand the contradictions and get to know the qualities of Sophia Cunningham's soul, the modesty and her pride, the cheerfulness and gaiety that sometimes mask the ways she both resisted and expressed the prejudices of her class, the extraordinary generosity she extended to others, even when she possessed barely more than the best of the see her and finally, her courage and ethical resilience. The aristocratic society into which Countess Cunningham was born may be extinct, but the competing currents of her time still resonate with us and influence contemporary history. The conflict between philanthropy and economic justice. The conflict between gradual reform and violent revolution. Her story reminds us of the contingency of history. The kind of progress to which she dedicated her life before the Great War was not necessarily doomed. It was a combination of personal choices and historical events, not fate, which condemned the Countess to living the last of her life as a stateless refugee. Long consigned to the dustbin of history in favor of communists like Alexander Kuntai, Sophia Pioneer made a dramatic re-entry into historical memory in post-Soviet Russia, reminding us that we can never know how history works. twice her age, um, this is the People's House, and this uh, is Alexandra Pesha-Kornova. She was a school teacher, spinster school teacher, and uh, the equivalent of a one-room school house in St. Petersburg, and so she came back when she was 19 years old. Don't know what. In fact, they them together. They started working together to create what eventually became this institution in 1990. And Pina credits this older woman from a very different class, very different social background, as being her inspiration. She also clearly, and these were the letters she wrote to her girlfriend that revealed to me how. She became increasingly disillusioned with the high society leader uh, that her class, her aristocratic status, uh, put her in. Uh, she, and she writes quite scathingly, and I quote it in the book, about the going to the coronation of Nicholas and how repulsive the people of her lover who were there. Uh, she also went to college. Uh, she went to, she attended the higher women's courses, which was the equivalent of women's college in St. Petersburg, and really became, well, we know, power of education. She absolutely became uh, transformed by what turned out to be a very short experience. And it was also the times. In the 1890s, this was the ethos of service to society and incipient revolutionary values. Non religion. Interesting. She had a strong sense of uh, the necessity uh, of the wealthy to be good stewards of their wealth. And talks about, uh, I can't remember the quote exactly, but she says it's 
um, she she was reminded of how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a uh, rich person to get to heaven, and sometimes she wishes she were the needle and not the camel. Uh, so she had, especially when she inherited her family's wealth uh, at the end of the 1890s, she felt an enormous obligation to give it away, and she gave it away massively. Now, she also enjoyed life. This is her mansion. Uh, outside of Moscow, the uh, mansion of Mark, you know, this is actually taken last year. Um, there's a picture with me um, that was taken in 1998, which was my first visit. It actually belongs to, and this is her mansion, uh, was her mansion in the Crimea. The morphing of the mansion outside of Moscow belongs to the Ministry of Defense, so uh, it's a little difficult. I'm curious, <laughs> <laughs> what were you able to find out about where she was in New York and in California based on those pictures and everything else you've been describing? Right. Um, she wrote letters from uh, California and she also wrote uh, three short essays called California Impressions, which she published in, in an emigrant magazine or newspaper. And so I was able to reconstruct, that was in the Columbia Archive, so I was able to reconstruct uh, her experiences in California. She loved, she lived in L.A., and she loved California. But when, uh, uh, as she began to hear uh, about the, uh, when, while she was in California, uh, World, War I, World War II began, September of 1939, and then she really wanted desperately to get back to, to the East Coast. So uh, I, I had access to a lot of letters that she wrote in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, both uh, in, uh, largely in France, in a collection of France, but also some uh, the the pieces that she wrote about California or yeah, at Columbia. She wrote about a, a play she saw, a musical, put on by the uh, WPA's uh, Negro Theater Company. She loved it. It was called Run, Little Chillin', Run, and she saw it was fantastic. And then she wrote about a women's group, political group, that she was uh, full of admiration of. And then she heard uh, Amy Semple, Semple McPherson uh, give a uh, preach at her big temple out there in Los Angeles and, and thought she was a uh, big phony. So those were the, <laughs> she didn't like the United States very much. Most Russian immigrants of her class did not like the U.S. Too crude, too rushed, uh, too material, Americans were too materialistic. She called Americans half-baked. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Craig. Okay. And I'm sorry, Olga, I, I, it's Olga, I'm sorry. But thanks for your question. Oh, sure. um, so it seems that you may have been the only person to visit an archive and look up anything about the town of this, um, being that there's not much written about it. Were most of these archives at least curating the collection to some extent to give you easier access? Yes, yes. Um, they were they were all pretty well organized, uh, and, and people were interested. In, in, that I was interested, especially as as a foreigner. But uh, so once I once I got there, it was fairly easy then to find out what they had. What's it like being a biographer? Chase this woman to 25 questions or you miss her? Yes and no. Yes and no. I, uh, I, I felt that I had learned as much as I possibly could. And there were still these, as I said, white spots. And 
no more amount of work was going to make them go away. Uh, so it was really, it was really time to finish. And there's a very odd way in which by writing a biography, you tend to start at the beginning, and then you end. <laughs> And you're getting older as they're getting older. And that, that was a really interesting experience. I remember when first uh, researching about her flight from Russia in 1920, and she was then not quite 50 years old. And I was then not quite 50 years old. I'm thinking, how did she, like, where did she go to the bathroom? You know, what? What about all of these sort of intimate things that you, you are mindful of as you're getting older? So I finally got to the end of her life, not quite to the end of mine. But uh, there's a way in which I miss writing biography, yes. Uh, it, it was really important to do. Well, I am certainly hoping to be able to translate it to Russian. But, um, and people in Russia want, uh, the people I know, want very much to read it. It would be a big project because they have to go back to all the archival sources, and, which I translated into English for the English version. And find the original in Russian, so I can't, I can't unload my file tours yet. But, so it, it will be a big project. Um, but yes, I, I certainly. Can. One of the, the things that people in the field, in the Russian history have said that's very useful, is your ability to go in your own voice with the voice of the mother. And I was wondering if you could just say how you managed to do that with the rest of the So uh, that's mostly in the introduction, uh, although maybe more subtly in the, in the main text of the book. It was, uh, for me, a very bold decision to put myself in the introduction and to make the intro at least to begin the introduction as the story of my discovery of her and my coming to terms with the challenges of reconstructing her life represented and interpreting this charming person from a very different era. So, once I made that decision, I was surprised that the introduction almost wrote itself. Nothing else in this book wrote itself. But the introduction proved to be the easiest. Finding a way to write because, because as a biographer, you are, you, you live with this person for a very long period of time. It's a very intimate relationship, isn't it? It's another uh, two biographers right mm -hmm. here. It's just a, uh, it's, it's spooky. Uh, she came to, a, to me in a dream once. Um, and uh, so it's a... It's only once, only once. Unfortunately, only once. <laughs> um, so, was it helpful? Yeah. Yes, because it was at the very beginning of the project, and she didn't say anything in my dream. But she gave me to understand that it was okay with her that I was doing this book. Because that has been a concern of mine, too. I don't think she would. She did not want to be a self She destroyed. She destroyed documents. I, I found, late in my research, I found a letter she wrote to a relative in Paris in which she said, I'm giving my papers, organizing my papers to give to Columbia University, and I'm burning everything that is personal and dear to me. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
Uh, that was a that was a <laughs> certainly a struggle. I mean, some biographical subjects go to great extent to to elude you, and, and I felt I felt this kind of uh, right. I was kind of uh, you know, tracking it down. So you said before that you wrote a chapter and you discovered a new file and a, a document. Can you, can you give us some ideas of, of, of what you discovered and how that content forced you to sort of rethink? Yeah, it? sure. Um, yeah. In the 1890s, as I briefly mentioned, uh, after she filed for divorce, I don't know why, but I, I read in the book, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, after she got for divorce, she started uh, these higher women's courses in St. Petersburg. And I had found in the archive in St. Petersburg that had been closed for 10 years, I found the records of this women's college and her letter of withdrawal. And she explains in this official letter of withdrawal that uh, she's withdrawing from enrollment because she's very involved in philanthropic work. So I wrote that. And that was done, that chapter three is done, okay. And then these letters to her girlhood friend <coughs> are discovered. And she writes quite clearly there that she left, decided to leave the higher women's courses because of all of the political unrest and the repression by the Tsarist government against women's education. And so it was political reasons and not personal reasons. It was probably a combination of both. But that's, uh, I had to go back and, and rewrite that. And there was something else that I learned uh, from these letters that caused me to we write another part of that particular chapter, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what this is. Of course. Yeah, I had a question about genre. Uh, what is the difference between biography and biography written by historian, historical biography? <laughs> I thought it was easy, huh? No. I thought... No, is that? I don't, I don't ask my fellow biographers. I don't know how you could. <coughs> you could write literary biography. That's a different genre. In which your focus is really on the origins of a writer, their style, their development. Uh, 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 how can you write a biography without knowing the historical? Context. Uh, so uh, there is a literary biography, and then you're looking at the influences that shaped the writer. Uh, but even there, you, you need some of the skills of the historian. And it's maybe it's it's the historic it's the historian skills that are absolutely critical. Being able to analyze the document's reliability, finding these, taking these little pieces of string, the loose end, and then following it here, and then goes around there, and, uh, and the, uh, the practice of reconstructing an event, an episode, from disparate sources, especially if you don't have, if, I didn't have somebody who wrote her life. I was born, and then, you know, uh, she, she just, was not helpful. Maybe one more question or comment and then refreshments? I'm not a historian, but I am just dead. Right, that's right. And it's really well written. And it, and it puts history in a perspective that Interesting and illuminating for the way. Thank you all so much.